Nobody could ever find us on the map because our address was just a post office box at the university. And I rented a broken down hotel room in downtown Starkville for $16 a month. That's 50 cents a day. It was a room that couldn't be rented to anybody else. The plumbing didn't work and there was no furniture. It was in pretty sad shape. And I was doing everything by myself, etching, drilling, stuffing, and soldering the PC boards, taking the orders, shipping the orders, writing the ads, everything. For after a few months, the hotel manager ran me off. I was making too much racket and stinking up the place. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that was MFK's first factory. When we started selling assembled, wired, and tested filters, I used to take these little bags of parts to my classes that I was teaching, and I would ask if any of my students wanted to put these filters together for 25 cents a piece. And that was MFK's first production line. <laughs> I used to see how a local telephone repairman working around Starkville, and I would stop him and asked if I could have his old scrap telephone wire that was in the back of his pickup truck. That's what we used to wire up the filters. I think that was a double. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend who taught eighth grade and he needed a project for his students. And his students took the scrap telephone wire and cut them to length stripped the ends and sorted them by length. And they were also part of MFK's first production line. And to mount the print, to mount the printed circuit boards in the cabinet, we just glued them in with F-16 glues. That's that brown, gooey glue that you used to glue on a wall panel. We just set them at an angle and just glued them in. <coughs> Well, after a while, I figured out what my fellow Hampton really wanted was a plug and play filter that was fully assembled and ready to use in a cabinet. And I bought these nice painted aluminum cabinets from Radio Shack. And it wasn't long before we bought all the little aluminum cabinets that Radio Shack had in the entire country. <laughs> there were no more. And we couldn't get any more. So I, so I found someone locally to cut up and bend up little aluminum sheets so we could make our own cabinets. And I bought a uh, spray paint machine from Sears and Roebuck. And we stood outside in front of our little 50 foot trailer wearing these old World War II gas masks. <laughs> and we spray painted the aluminum cabinets. And pretty soon, all oh, the cars parked around us started looking like the color of our cabinets. <laughs> the major problem was how to put nice clean hose in the aluminum cabinet for the switches and the phone jacks and the terminal strips. I went to our local tool and die shop and had them build a punch and die set for making the hose. It was, it was two half inch thick pieces of steel that were separated about a tenth of an inch. And they had a hole pattern for the switches and the jacks. And a bunch of hole, we took the metal cabinet and slipped it in. And then we took the heart of the punch and dropped it in. And then we took a hammer and just hit it really hard. And it would punch out a nice clean hole. <laughs> that filter cabinet had 11 holes. So we had to swing that hammer 11 times. I hired one of my students, and his whole purpose in life was to swing that hammer all day long. <laughs> Boy, that was MFJ's first punch press. <laughs> I didn't have a car that ran good enough to make it to the ham fest. So I would invite students to go along who had a car. <laughs> and sometimes I would go back to Hollandale and borrow my brother's car. You know, it's a wonder that I ever got married. My girlfriend taught ninth grade uh, 
and before we were married, I borrowed her a brand new car and put a huge U-Haul trailer full of MFJ products that Dave and Ham mentioned. <laughs> Burned out her transmission. <laughs> yeah, she never let it borrow it again. <laughs> After teaching classes on Thursday, I would drive all night to the Dayton Convention. That way, I didn't have to pay for a hotel room. And then on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I would set up sell, break down, and then I would drive back all night Sunday, just in time to give my eight o'clock lecture the next morning. <clears throat> and I spent the summer of 1974 with some students that I hired and designed, tooled up, and got into production seven more products. We placed our first full page I had in QST Magazine in September, and two years later we added a new antenna tuner, and a new toll-free uh, watch line, telephone line, and so more in that November than in the entire previous year. We grew from six employees to over 30 in a few months, and I bought an old skating rink in Starkville and moved in. I finally quit teaching at Mississippi State, and we had uh, about 30 employees. I never got around to doing the dissertation so I never got the PhD degree. But that's how MFJ got started. And now, 47 years later, instead of two products, we have over 2,000 different ham radio products. Instead of a hammer, we now have computer controlled punch presses. Instead of handing a bag full of parts to students, we have automated PC board assembly. Instead of a tiny two inch by two inch ad, we're ham radio's largest advertiser. And we manufacture more pieces of ham radio equipment than any other ham radio company in the world. 92% of our products go through ham radio stores, and 25% of our sales are exported to over 35 countries. 25% of our employees that were with us 30 years ago are still with us. Forty-one percent of our employees have been with us for over ten years. Twenty percent of our employees have been with us for over twenty years, and we have six employees who have been with us for over thirty-five years. You know, one of the best-known people in ham radio here tonight used to work, work for us right out of college. That's Ray Novak of ICON. <laughs> Is Ray here? Okay, I'm, I'm riding back to the airport with him at five o'clock this morning, or tomorrow morning. But thank you very much. I have really enjoyed the jack. <laughs>